Good to see everyone this morning. We are going to spend the first part of our study in Luke chapter 13. You can go ahead and be turning over there. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the pew in front of you, and it'll be on page 922. Page 922. While you're turning over there, I will uh, remind you that there are uh, some of the yearly Bible reading plans uh, in the foyer. I think there's four different versions that I put out. One of them's a five-day-a-week reading. The others are seven-day-a-week. And uh, the, ones of, the ones of you who are going to be following along with the plan that I'll be doing uh, as we join together in the email group, uh, it's the one on the very top, the McChaney uh, program. So if you just get the one on the very top, that's one you'll need. And those will begin tomorrow. We think about a year coming to a close... And this year, since January, we've been exploring the topic, Let Your Love Be Genuine. It's been an exceptional topic, I think. It's one that has helped me a great deal. You notice this morning, however, in Andy's reading, he read from a translation that had it in the negative, which several do. And instead of saying, let love be genuine, it says, let love be genuine without hypocrisy. You always have to take things with a grain of salt when you read how words came about and such, but one thing I have read in more than one place is that the terminology that's used there was a term that was used in the marketplace. And it would be for those who sold kind of these pottery vessels, the terracotta, I suppose, something of that material. And as would tend to happen as these were made, it would develop kind of a hairline crack in it, uh, which would mean it was no good. But if you had an unscrupulous businessman, what he would do is he would take that vessel that had that, that crack that could be seen but not barely, and he would put a glaze over it. And so for the unexpecting buyer when you came, you would see the glaze, but you would not be able to see that crack until you put something in it, and then things would not go as you wanted. That was a vessel that was not genuine. That was a vessel that had a problem. Had a problem, but something was kind of covering it up. And so it was no stretch to take that idea and to say, as the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, he says, don't let your love be some outward facade. Don't let your love be hypocritical, trying to cover up something on the inside that ought not to be there. Have you ever been called a hypocrite before? I suspect for most of us, if we've lived any length of time and if we've had many conversations about spiritual things, we likely have been. And regardless of how little or how many times that's happened to you, it stings. Because when someone calls you a hypocrite, what they're saying, either rightly or wrongly, is that there is a flaw within you that you are trying your best to keep covered up rather than correcting it just to pretend that it's not there or to get others not to see that flaw within you. When you go to the Bible, the term hypocrite is used a number of different times. But surprisingly, almost all of the uses of that term are used by the Lord. We find them in the four gospel accounts. And on many occasions, that's what Jesus is doing as really the one who has full ability to see beyond the glaze, to see what's truly there or not there. He would refer to those typically religious people as hypocrites. People who had a flaw, people who had a problem that they're trying to cover up. And what I'd like to do this morning is to take you to one account where Jesus does that here in Luke chapter 13. As we look primarily at a time when hypocrisy of all places is going to show up in the synagogue. And so here we've got a religious man in a religious place who's going to be called a hypocrite by our Lord. What we'll look at primarily this morning is going to be in verses 10 through 17, but I think it'll be helpful for us if we kind of set up the context that this is put in 
as the gospel writers are apt to do, they often will place these accounts to build a bigger picture. And I think that's what's going on here. That the supporting stories, the information around it, are helping to highlight the hypocrisy that's being shown by this one in the synagogue. And so if we go back to the beginning of chapter 13, We've got people who come to Jesus, and they're talking about those who they believe are guilty. And because of their guilt, they've suffered some kind of calamity. And so you might notice in verse 1, you've got them bringing up those Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And then down in verse 4, we'll have Jesus bringing this one up. He says, are those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them? Now, we'll see his point here in a minute. But the point that the people coming to Jesus were making was this. Here are people who experienced something terrible. Therefore, that means that they must have done something really bad. Don't we still have that today? Sometimes you'll have people who will have some terrible thing happen and there are those who will begin to say, well, that likely happened because it's punishment. That's a dangerous statement to make and it's one that Jesus did not let this crowd do. In fact, when he heard them say that, he said, no, that's not the case. And I want you to notice what he said on two different occasions. Look at verse 2. He said, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this way? And then in verse 4, Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? You think this particular sin is worse than everything else going on? And he makes the point to them, no. What needs to happen is that anyone who's guilty of sin, regardless if they met with some tragedy or not, anyone who's guilty of sin, as he's going to tell us in verse 3, needs to repent or will likewise perish. And he repeats it then, again in verse 5, they need to repent or you will all likewise perish. The point that he says is, where there is perceived smoke, there is not always fire. Sometimes bad things happen because bad things happen. Don't think that's a sign. What you need to understand is that anywhere where sin is present, forgiveness needs to be offered when someone comes repenting of that sin. He's going to follow that then with a description of a tree, a tree that looks really healthy. A tree that by all outward manifestations seems to be exactly where it needs to be. But the problem with this tree is that it's not bearing fruit. So verse 6 talks about a man who planted this tree in his vineyard and he came to seek fruit on it. Yet, this good looking tree wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. It was not bearing fruit. And so he allows that exchange, as Luke writes these things, he allows that to lead right in then to this picture of a barren religion. A religion that if you looked at it on the surface might look very healthy, might look like it's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing, but yet it was bearing no fruit. And so as this parable continues, there's a thought about tearing it down, of cutting the tree down of just taking it out. But it's given one more chance. He says, let it alone. We'll try to put some fertilizer around it. We'll see what happens. However, if there's no fruit on this tree next year, it's slated for destruction. And so we've got the warning being given is that when you allow sin to come in, And to take away what your religion is supposed to be doing to the point that it's not bearing fruit for the Lord, it's slated for destruction. And then on the other side of our hypocrisy in the holy place, we find another tree here, another parable, in which he says in verse 18, What is the kingdom of God like, and to what shall I compare it? 
It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden and it grew and became a tree and the birds of the air made nest in its branches. Here is a link to the kingdom. Here's a link to the way things should be in the kingdom of God. A seed's planted, it grows as it's supposed to. And of course, one of the primary points is that what looked insignificant grew into something everyone could see. I think it's important for us, though, to see the description that we have here. It became a tree. A tree in which the birds of the air are making their nest. And so what we've got within this kingdom is a picture of protection that's being provided, of something sizable enough to provide the protection that just as a tree does to the bird of the air, so this tree can provide protection. So look at what we've got now. Don't try to judge someone's wrongness based on outward circumstances. If there's sin there, regardless of the outcome, you need to repent or you're going to perish. And if you don't get that taken care of, the perishing is going to be, God's going to chop it down. He's not going to let it last. What He wants is for those who trust Him to find protection and provision within Him. Set in the midst of all of this, is an account that takes place with Jesus as he sees a woman come into the synagogue. And what we're shown in verse 11 is that this woman had had a disabling spirit. It's going to be variously translated there. For 18 years, she was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. If you have ever had a catch in your back, you can get a slight view of what this woman experienced. Have you ever got out of bed in the morning and you just couldn't straighten up? (laughs) You had to walk a little while to get things going. Here's a woman who experienced that every day for 18 years. I do think it's interesting that Luke brings out that it's 18 years, just like those 18 people on whom the Tower of Siloam fell. And I suspect what Luke is wanting us to kind of get from that connection is, here is an ailment that was not due because this woman was a worse offender. After all, where is she? Someone in this kind of condition, to say the least, had mobility issues. And yet she's crawled out of her bed, she's made it to the synagogue in order to worship God. Here is a woman who is innocent, at least in the standpoint of not deserving what's going on with her at this time. I think it's also important to note that she doesn't really seem to come because Jesus is there. It's Jesus who calls her over to Him. That will be a little more important, I think, as we look further in our study. But as Jesus sees the woman, He calls her to Him. And Luke writes to us and he says, He freed her from this disability. That's our same word for divorce. It's the same word as to be loosed. And so you've got Jesus saying, all right, by the power of God, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay my hands on you and you're going to be separated from this spirit, this problem that you've had for 18 years. And so he laid his hands on her. And then I think it's such a beautiful picture here in verse 13 when it says, immediately she was made straight And she glorified God. We can hardly imagine unless we have a chronic condition. 
If we had a condition that we were dealing with for that length of time and suddenly by the power of God we are healed, I think then we would understand what it means to glorify God. But as I mentioned earlier, this woman neither came nor asked to be healed as far as we know. She took advantage of the situation. But what that shows is she is not the main person in this account. This story is not about the bent over woman. What this story about is the ruler of the synagogue. Because after we read about the woman glorifying God, we don't know what happens to her. I'm sure she goes off rejoicing, continues to rejoice, gets to do things she hasn't done in 18 years. It's probably a great story there, but that's not the point. What happens now is we take a shift to the ruler of the synagogue. And as we look at the ruler of the synagogue, we go down to verse 14, and it says that he was indignant because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. That word indignant, it's a fiery word. It's kind of capturing the idea of anger and sadness and grief. Sometimes we might even talk about being just angered to tears about something. That's what we've got here. Now, the question is what would make a man get this upset about something as great as he just saw take place. Well, that's where we're kind of developing into the point of this account. And if you notice here, verse 14, he won't directly take Jesus on. In his indignation, it's a passive aggressiveness for sure. Notice what he says. He says to the people, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Can you imagine someone who's looking at a woman who he has likely seen week after week after week pull herself into the synagogue who's now standing straight in good health and he admonishes her. He says if you want to be healed, you got six other days to do that. Don't do it on the Sabbath day. And so then, He's come to the conclusion that what Jesus has just done in relieving this woman's burden is a violation of Torah truth. Now after Luke tells us this, he then goes to the Lord. And I want you to note that's what he calls him here in verse 15. Then the Lord answered him. Well, again, if we're putting the book of Luke together here, we find that that's probably a key back to chapter 6, verse 5, where Jesus announces the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Here is a leader in the synagogue that has just said that the Lord of the Sabbath has done something wrong. And thus, it should be a very little surprise to us that Jesus, the Lord, says, You hypocrites. You hypocrites. Broadening the net out here. Not just this guy, but all of these others who are present there also. He says, You know what? Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger? and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from the bonds on the Sabbath? Typical style of arguing, both then and now. Start with the lesser, move to the greater. If you can take care of an animal, you must take care of a human. I'm not so sure, though, that that's the primary point Jesus is making. I think it's much more likely that the point he's addressing is their hypocrisy. He's saying to them, where you are concerned, you're unwilling to suffer any loss on the Sabbath day. 
You're not willing for that animal to become dehydrated. You're not willing for that animal to become sick or die. You're not willing for that animal to get stuck in a ditch somewhere. You'll go and save it. And yet here is a woman who has been bound for 18 years and rather than expressing happiness over her relief on the Sabbath day, you've totally missed what it's all about. And so then... The point that Jesus is making is you fail to understand the purpose of the Sabbath. You don't understand that it's the day that God gave for rest, which is what I've just given to this woman. Rest from what she's experienced. As Luke continues, verse 17, Jesus said these things, as He said these things, all His adversaries, all His opponents were put to shame, we're told. And the people rejoiced at the glorious things that were done by Him. Here's the contrast. Here is a man angered to tears over what he perceives as a violation of Torah law, which he had totally misrepresented contrasted with a people now rejoicing in the glorious works of God. Here is a picture of fruitless trees. Here is a picture of those who looked like they knew what they should be doing, but the fruit was not there. And here were people who thus found no resting place within the kingdom. So I want to take this count now, and I want us to look at it in terms of this concept of letting love be without hypocrisy. We won't turn back to Romans chapter 12, but I want to remind you that that phrase, let love be genuine or let love be without hypocrisy, that's not the beginning of a new thought. Paul has been following that through the chapter. He says in verse 1, you need to be a living sacrifice. In verse 3, he says, and don't make it about yourself. If you are a living sacrifice to God, you are the least of the concerns here. It's to God's glory. And he says the way that one of the ways you're a living sacrifice and that you don't make it about yourself is that you let your love be without hypocrisy. You are genuinely concerned for others. Now, when we take that idea and we look at it in the context of this account where Jesus points out what religious hypocrisy looks like, it's important for us to understand the message. One of the things that we find in the ruler's zeal for the Sabbath is that he had completely lost sight of God. God was was seemingly not in his focus. And probably more than seemingly, when Jesus flat out says, you're hypocritical for this. What he had done is he had allowed his zeal to do what he defined as truth to eliminate the bearing of fruit. That's what happens when you lose sight of God. So then, we want to make sure we we don't miss the point. Truth is absolutely, ultimately important. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6 says, We rejoice in truth. That's part of what love does. Love rejoices in truth. But here's, here's the deal with that. It's got to be the Lord's truth. It's got to be the Lord who is saying, this is the way it's supposed to be, and we follow that. That's where he was missing the boat on this. He had allowed his concept of truth to replace what God had established way back in the beginning with this concept of the Sabbath rest. So what are the dangers that we face then? When we think about truth and not representing truth, I think there's two dangers 
that we've got to be concerned about, one of those can be that we're sincerely teaching a mistaken view. Let me give you an example of that. You remember Apollos, an eloquent man, competent in the Scriptures, Acts 18 tells us. Fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. What happens? He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. There is so much I love about this story. I love Aquila and Priscilla for what they did. I love the fact that they took him aside. They did not make him a spectacle out of this. They gave him the benefit of the doubt. And I love the fact that when this counts concluded, we find Apollos going on and now teaching the full truth. Sometimes good people can just be mistaken. Sometimes good people can be wrong, and good people need good people to come and say, let's talk about this a little bit. So that's one thing. But there's another danger, and that danger is seeking to teach a Christ-free Christianity. (laughs) That sounds like an odd term, doesn't it? But yet, it's the concept of where you're trying to teach something about Christianity, but not by the authority of Jesus. I wonder if that's what the Lord has in mind When he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I do find it intriguing that it's immediately preceded by discussion of tree and fruit, just as we find there in Luke 13. People who are seeking to teach something, but not in the purity in which it was given, as from the mind of God. We do well to heed that warning, because it's very easy like this ruler, and I'm putting this in quotes, to know the rules, but to forget why those rules are rules. To forget there's a purpose behind everything God has said. That is, we're going to talk about, Lord willing, in this coming year, how that every command of God is given for the purpose of making us like Him, to be holy. And so here's the danger, that if my religion, my tradition, my church is my sole motivation, I've fallen into the same trap as this guy. Is religion important? It absolutely is. Is church important? It's so important Jesus died so that we could be a part of it. But if these things ever become my total focus, I've missed it. I can be like a guy who watches a woman who's been disabled for 18 years straighten and get angry about that. That's the danger. Let me point out one other. In this ruler's zeal for the Sabbath, He also lost sight of other people. The Sabbath was made so that man would have this very special day under the Mosaic law, representing what God wanted as that peace and that rest. And yet some, like this man, had made it into a burden. And in so doing, they had lost sight of others. Of those created in the image of God, who they should have joined in glorifying God when something this good happened. So in his zeal, he lost sight of that. So what are the dangers that we think about? Well, just as we face the danger 
of losing sight of God, of, of trying to follow His commands, to have this Christ-free Christianity. There's also this danger of also losing sight of our not only command and obligation, but privilege of helping others. Sometimes that can be when I try to maximize someone else's problem to minimize a problem of my own. You remember when Jesus talked about the speck in your brother's eye and the log in your own eye? That's what this is talking about. That I've got this major issue going on, but in my hypocrisy, I'm going to point out every flaw of my brother so that it kind of keeps the spotlight off of me. So that I can join in looking down on someone rather than trying to, to get back to being the kind of tree that's bearing fruit. That's a danger. And it's so easy to fall into. As well, sometimes it's jealousy that's perceived over the popularity of another. We talked about that a few weeks ago with the Apostle Paul. He's in jail and there's all these people out there preaching the gospel because they're jealous of him or envious. I don't know what was going on. But he says, you know what? If Christ is being preached... That's all I'm concerned about. He wasn't excusing them. But he's saying, I'm not getting into that kind of thing. But yet, how often do we see this? When there's someone even within the family of God who grows jealous of someone else. And so they try to point out the problems of that other person to try to bring down that popularity, at least what the person perceives as their popularity. But maybe this is the biggest one, just a lack of compassion. Humanity struggles with that. That as we think about our fellow person, that there's this danger of becoming hardened to the point that we can look at someone else's grief, someone else's struggles, and it just really doesn't bother us. That's what we see in this man. Jude wrote this, Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Here is the ability to look at someone and to say what I can do as a sign of mercy for that person. Is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you something that you already know. And that is, life can be really hard. I'm going to tell you something else you already know. It can sap the strength out of you. Every day... We are passing people who have probably had a really hard time just getting themselves up and going. We need to be concerned. And we need to have the kind of Christ-like spirit that would say, as He showed compassion, so am I. And I'm not going to look at this person and try to beat the person up. And I'm not going to look at this person and say, you know, you could be doing all kinds of things to better yourself. I'm going to do what I can to help. And some of that may be some very gently placed advice on changing lifestyles. Or maybe it'll come to a point, as Jude says, snatch them out of the fire. Maybe at some point you've got to get a little bit strong. But you're not going to destroy the person trying to pull them out of the fire. You're going to look at them with a genuine love that seeks their best. I hope for all of us that as we are... Ending 12 months 
of this keen focus on genuine love for God and genuine love for others, that if there is any vestige of hypocrisy within us, that we are going to kill it. And that we are going to be a people who are genuinely loving God and genuinely loving others, just as we see within our Savior. So then, let's let our love be without hypocrisy. Appreciate your good attention this morning. I don't know that I need to add a lot to what Gary said this morning as far as an invitation is concerned. Let me just hit the two high points. We know what awaits for those who refuse God. We know the links God has gone to to save us. And I hope this morning that you have been touched in your heart with that message. Regardless, you were baptized yesterday or 50 years ago. But I hope it for sure for those who have not yet become Christians. That you will think about the genuine love God has shown for you. And that you'll make the commitment to Him this morning to be buried in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. So that He can raise you up. Resurrect you to newness of life. So that in the time you have remaining on earth, you can show this genuine love we've talked about. And you can look forward to eternity of basking in that genuine love of God. You need to respond to His invitation. You can come now as we stand and sing together.